for our COBT viewers and listeners, it's Maynard, Mike, and Arjun here with something that we have been looking for for a long time, which is uh, someone we could have an extensive conversation about China with. And we've gotten super lucky to find David Sachs. He's a fellow for Asia Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. His work there includes U.S.-China relations, U.S.-Taiwan relations, Chinese foreign policy, and cross-strait relations, meaning the Taiwanese straits. And he's also a scholar of Hans Morgenthau, the esteemed uh, political scientist of the 20th century. So he's got a ton to add on uh, all aspects of China as it relates to security, defense, economy, macro influence. David, let me just pause by saying thank you so much for joining. Uh, it's a real honor to have you. Great. Thanks for having me. All right. Uh, Mike, before we jump in with David, uh, what would you tell us about the markets? We're in airing season. We've kind of towed in. What's on your mind, my friend? Yeah. Um, yeah, we are really starting to kick into earnings season, uh, Q1 earnings season. And, uh, and so today we see you know, bonds going kind of sideways and equities uh, are going up pretty nicely today. The Dow's up two, 300 points. Uh, and so you know, I think what we really want to talk about today is you know, what's going on with bonds. Bonds look like they've kind of, the 10-year looks like it's kind of stabilized around the 4.6% uh, percent area. Uh, it's looking for a, you know, increase in economic data. And, and one of those big stats that's coming out on Friday is going to be the uh, PC deflator, which is one of Powell's preferred inflation measures. So the markets can really be anticipating that on Friday. Uh, from a commodity standpoint, crude oil has kind of pulled back a couple dollars here. WTI is around $83 a barrel. And I think a lot of people are wondering, like, you've got this Mideast Mid conflict here and, and crude oil hasn't rallied. It actually has gone down what does that mean? You know, I think a lot of that, what, what that meant is that some, you know, some, some, some war premium was built into crude oil prices. But on the other side, you're hearing some people saying that right now, uh, the markets are not dialing what could be some serious Mideast conflict. And, and if we do get some serious Mideast conflict, it is definitely not dialed into oil prices. And so we would see oil prices go much higher and equity markets probably go much lower. So, you know, something to think about. As it relates to broader equities, you know, obviously we talked about it earlier, Q1 earnings kick in. I don't think people realize how volatile this week can be. 35% of the S&P 500 reports this week. So expect a lot of volatility. From the standpoint of equity market uh, from a relative strength index, we went from you know, overbought to oversold levels, a little bit of above oversold levels today with the markets rallying. But from a basically, you know, volatility index standpoint, we were probably up to two days ago at one year highs, but nowhere near two to three year highs. And, you know, we talked about the, you know, volatility with the crude oil markets. If we have something happen in the Mideast, uh, volatility could go a heck of a lot higher and markets could go a heck of a lot lower. So something to think about, you know, from the standpoint of energy equities, another big week uh, is starting this week. We've, we've counted over 40 companies that are reporting this week, be it service name, EMPs, oil major, refiners. Uh, mining companies and electric utilities. And one thing we want to say with electric utilities, uh, last week, electric utilities were up around 6%, best performing S&P sector last week. Not a lot of people know that. You know, this week we had, um, you know, some companies start off with earnings and we expect the whole electricity theme to be a big theme. We even saw that on Halliburton's call today, them talking about electricity. So expect that's going to be a huge thing going forward. And now that we have our guest on uh, today, what we want to do is really kind of highlight Asian markets and, and how they've done year to date. You know, Asian markets have been a little bit mixed. The best performing uh, market this year has been Japan, up around 12%. Second best market has been Taiwan, up about 8%. China's up around 3%, and it kind of goes down from there. So we just want to have a little bit of that lead and just give you a flavor for what's going on in those markets. Awesome. Well, lots going on right now. Arjun, what would you share with us before we turn to David? You know, Minut, I thought I'd build upon Mike's comments about sort of geopolitical risk premium in the oil price. And it's a question, as you can imagine, we get from time to time, especially when uh, things are going on in that region. And the question is always, is there a five or $10 premium in the oil price? Or why isn't there a five or $10 premium, depending on how people are perceiving the events? And I, I just wanted to take a step back and kind of talk through how we think through geopolitical risk premium, because it doesn't quite fall into this bucket of sort of war or no war. And I'd say that there's kind of three elements. There's one is, when is there a structural change to a major producer? Two, when or how does civil strife or sanctions uh, impact production? And third is this war. So I'll go through these quickly. The best example of structural change is actually Venezuela. 
When they opened up in the 1990s, uh, Luis Giusti was head of PDVSA. They went from two to three and a half million barrels a day. This was a time post the 70s and 80s where there was still a lot of non-OPEC supply. The Soviet Union was in the process of collapsing. So that sort of extra production from Venezuela was sort of a structurally bearish increment to oil prices. That then dramatically changed in the early 2000s when President Chavez took over and the 1%, 33% royalty and tax rates. And I'm I'm sure we have a COBT viewer who can provide the exact figure. They went up to 16% royalty, 50% tax rates until the point that the fields were effectively nationalized. And Venezuela went from producing uh, over 3 million barrels a day to today under a million barrels a day, a structurally bearish turn for the worst that has impacted oil price markets for the next 20 years, but especially during that super cycle era of the 2000s, losing a chunk. And that is the most meaningful geopolitical change you have when there's some structural change to these countries sort of opening or closing, classically the collapse of the Soviet Union, and then the subsequent opening of Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan. A second bucket would be the civil strife countries. That would be things like Libya post Gaddafi. Um, we might throw Iran with the sanctions. I'm going to put them in that bucket. Nigeria with the Niger Delta and the production. This is where uh, production on a monthly or quarterly basis kind of goes up and down. And, and it can frustrate investors because they'll say, how am I supposed to forecast that? And what we have found is it's hard to forecast, but you can look at the trends and say, are we today on or are we today off? And there is sort of an inherent, I'm going to call it cyclicality to these types of productions. If you actually aggregate those four countries, you can make educated guesses based on everything else I know. Is the oil market today tight or loose? And is that disrupted country's production on or off to kind of make a risk reward call on oil price? That's kind of the second bucket of sort of geopolitical risk premium or how we think about analyzing these things. The third bucket is this classic sort of Middle East war. It's something that's sort of always worried about. I'm not sure there's a lot of great examples where it's had a material impact. And probably the best example that turned out to be during a very bearish time was to go back to the Iranian revolution in 1979, which is now 45 years ago, and the start of the Iran-Iraq war in 1980. Iran was producing 6 million barrels a day and Iraq nearly for it. So about 10 million barrels a day of production. The war started, oil prices were up tenfold over that decade from three to 30 nominal. And they lost between the two of them 7 million barrels a day. And what happened? Oil prices collapsed because demand actually fell by 6 million barrels a day. And now OPEC supplied the North Slope. Uh, the North Sea was just coming on and it grew by 6 or 7 million barrels a day. So the one time you had real war and real major disruptions that took out a huge chunk of production, your overall context in oil markets was one that was more bearish. And so I, I get why the questions are asked. Um, even if you look at, say, the Iraq War, the second one, Gulf War II, um, the expectation was Iraq would go from 2 million barrels a day after that war was settled to as much as 10 million barrels a day 10 years later. I mean, it's now 20 years later, and they're barely at four and a half. And so trying to get these country calls right can be very tricky. It can be very counterintuitive. Um, and it doesn't mean we shouldn't take it seriously. We are at a time when OPEC spare capacity, I'm going to say, is still generally low, even though it's a little bit higher than it was two years ago. We're at a time where demand is still growing, despite everyone's expectations for peak demand. And we're at a time where outside of shale, a little bit in Guyana and Brazil, no one's trying to grow supply because everyone's under the perception this business is going away. So if we were to have more meaningful disruptions, I suppose that could lead to meaningfully higher prices. But I think you still have to pause and say, is a country impacted? And is there a structural change to that country that is going to lead to more than just, say, a short-term blip in supply disruption? So it, this is probably better done in a future super spike piece manner. But I think there's a lot to think about when we talk about geopolitical premium in oil prices, well beyond some notion of Israel, Iran, or any other singular kind of a turmoil situation like that. And with that, Maynard, I'm very excited to talk about China with our guest today, and I'll turn it back over to you. That's wonderful. Well, thanks, guys, for the lead in. And David, again, welcome. It's, we're so excited uh, to have you. Appreciate you spending some time with us. I, I was ticking through um, uh, you know, your history. You've been at the Council on Foreign Relations for uh, not quite seven years now. You've been thinking about uh, China and China-related issues for, for much longer than that. Uh, we've honestly been um, intrigued by the China contribution to the macro, both from a 
security standpoint, economy standpoint, you know, China is just so important. And our relationship with them has changed so dramatically over the last six, seven, uh, eight years. Um, as a lead in, what, what, what has got you jumping out of bed every morning as a China expert? Like what is top of the top of the list uh, for someone like yourself in today's world in terms of issues or things you're watching or the next big event? Like what's a China watcher most attuned to in today's world? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, there's no shortage of topics or issues that I'm kind of thinking about and reading about on a daily basis. I would say that because of my background, I'm asked most about Taiwan and you know uh, Taiwan Strait contingencies, just because the impact would be so vast. There was a study recently by Bloomberg that put the economic hit of a of a conflict over Taiwan at $10 trillion, which is roughly 10% of global GDP. So I think that a conflict over Taiwan is still in the kind of low likelihood, but the, the enormity of the impact means that people are really focused on that. Um, and a lot of that was really the attention was focused because during the pandemic, we all realized the importance of semiconductors and how concentrated that that is on the island of Taiwan. But I would say that, you know, I'm generally not an optimist, but I don't believe that we're heading towards a conflict over Taiwan in 2024 or 2025 uh, for a number of kind of structural uh, reasons that I'm happy to get into. What worries me a lot more is actually in the South China Sea right now, where here you have a U.S. Uh, alliance relationship with the Philippines, a mutual defense treaty with the Philippines and China actively, uh, you know, essentially blockading uh, Second Thomas Shoal in the Philippines exclusive economic zone where they have a kind of rusting uh, hull of a ship that they grounded years ago. Um, and China employing water cannons on Filipino vessels with the potential to 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 kill some uh, Filipino servicemen. And President Biden has clearly said on multiple occasions that that would invoke the mutual defense treaty, the treaty that the United States has with the Philippines. So I think that that's something that is much closer to us than is generally um, seen. Um, this is literally a ship that at any moment could rust away and uh, we would have a, a crisis on our hands, in my view. And I think that China is looking at this as a pressure point where they could potentially really strain or even break the U.S.-Philippines alliance because they would like to send that message broader in the region to countries like Japan, South Korea, Taiwan. You know, you can't rely on the United States. They're not going to be there for you uh, when you need it. And so I think that there is a looming crisis in the South China Sea right now. Um, that isn't necessarily appreciated outside of these kind of smaller circles focused on Asian security. So, David, maybe I could ask you a question as a, I don't know if I qualify even as a China layman, uh, but at least uh, uh, just a perception uh, from someone who's not an expert, which is that as it relates to all these boundaries, whether it's near Vietnam, near the Philippines, near Taiwan, just all these boundaries China just has its own aggressive definition of what those boundaries are. And China uniquely seems to interpret them in ways that none of the rest of us do. And that is a big source of uh, potential conflict. Is that a fair characterization or are some of these, some of these disputes more, um, more valid? I mean, that's fair. Uh, you know, China has a now infamous nine dash line uh, in the South China Sea. And within that nine dash line, it has never really stated what it's claiming. It has left it ambiguous, um, but it refers to things that have no basis in, inter in international law, like historic rights and things of that nature. Uh, the Philippines took uh, China to an international tribunal, um, and that international tribunal uh, under ITLOS, they ruled that China's claims had no validity, but China has rejected that tribunal. Um, you know, when you want to talk about the way that US China relations have really changed uh, so rapidly over the last five to seven years, I think a key point to, to kind of look at is when Xi Jinping visited uh, President 
President Obama in 2015, and when he was standing next to President Obama in the Rose Garden, said that China would not militarize the South China Sea, made that pledge next to the American president. And now you look at any satellite imagery, you can see that China has extensive bases that it has built um, on all of these. They're not even islands. They're really little features uh, throughout the South China Sea. And so I think for many American policymakers working on the China portfolio, for those studying China as well, that was really a, uh, a pivotal moment in seeing that you know, whatever China says, uh, it, it's going to do something else if it decides that that's in its interests. And also, that China's ambitions are far greater than we once um, than we once thought. And so, um, you know, I think that as most people look at this region as well, the primary target of this in the South China Sea is to uh, what we call anti-access area denial to prevent U.S. forces from coming to the aid of our allies and partners in the region, as well as maintaining the potential during peacetime to regulate commerce and the flow of goods uh, within the first island chain, which is vital for global commerce. And so China is now basically asserting that it can exercise that if and when it chooses to do so. Um, but to get back to your point more narrowly, I think it is a fair characterization. No country in the world shares China's view of um, of the South China Sea. It has been invalidated through an international tribunal, but China continues to press ahead, and and nobody has been able to to stop that. So, so you've been involved in a couple of uh, studies that the Council on Foreign Relations uh, has has uh, sponsored. Uh, one is the uh, Belt and Road Initiative, uh, focused on on that, and the other was the the cross strait uh, sort of situation, if you will. So on this cross strait, um, you know what you're pointing to, which is the potential for conflict associated with um, naval traffic and and control of the waters and so on and so forth. And maybe talk to us about that because if you're the U.S. and China says you can't come here. Aren't you kind of forced to say, no, we're not going to play by those rules. We're going to sail ships through those places. And is that the basic source of a potential a conflict? Or talk to us some more about bringing down the risk uh, in, in all these, uh, these critical waterways. Well, we conduct um, freedom of navigation operations throughout the South China Sea, as well as in the Taiwan Strait. And if you listen to spokespeople from the Department of Defense, they say consistently that the United States will fly or sail wherever international law allows. And so, you know, we exercise the right to, to do that. And China has become, I would say, far more aggressive in um, trailing those ships and, and planes at attempting to intercept them, having unsafe maneuvers. Uh, in my view, that's a deliberate uh, tactic that China is using because they believe that if they increase the risk of U.S. operations in the region, we'll essentially pull back because you don't want something like the 2001 EP3 incident where we did have planes collide, the loss of life on the Chinese side, and um, you know a, a standoff over a matter of multiple days before the Chinese even picked up the phone to talk about the incident. So um, the bottom line is we continue to sail and operate where international law allows, but China is trying to make that a riskier proposition. And that's can I, why- can I, just, can I just ask you one question on that? That, because um, I know a lot of military people have been involved in in you know some of this thinking and some of this strategizing and some of your studies, is that sailing through international waters, does that sort of happen on autopilot? Or is it more the, the White House says, okay, let's deliberately next quarter or next couple of quarters, let's deliberately go through those areas. Like how much of it just happens automatically because that's how we approach things versus uh, being a deliberate order from, from the administration? It's an interesting question because in the China context, I would say it is quite deliberate. Um, you know, specifically where we're sailing, in what manner we're sailing, um, and what we are attempting to demonstrate through international law. There's a different message. It's calibrated differently, and the timing is important as well. So it isn't as though 
you know, a ship driver is just out in the Pacific saying it would be cool to to get close to this island that China has a, a military base on. Um, this is heavily coordinated with lawyers in the Department of Defense who are very familiar with, um, you know, UNCLOSE and the relevant international law. Um, so it's not random and it's not ad hoc at all. There's There's also... You know, it's very deliberate on whether we just do it, but don't announce that we're doing it, but the Chinese mm. will know that we're doing it, or whether we telegraph and publicly say, um, this is what we've done and this is why. So this is all, uh, I would say, very, very centrally uh, controlled and coordinated. I'm realizing, David, I have a confession. <laughs> I'm going to have to ask you about the balloon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, that's not highbrow uh, foreign policy or military strategy. But what was that? Uh, what, just tell us, as a Chinese expert, what, what, what was your take on that whole incident? So my take was that, um, you know, the, the fact that the balloon happened is not necessarily a game changer. I don't believe that China gained some exquisite intelligence collection capabilities that they couldn't necessarily get elsewhere. Um, and I don't think that it revealed anything about China's capabilities um, that we didn't already know or, or appreciate. Um, so I would say that there's two kind of interesting things that I learned. In my view, um, I don't believe that Xi Jinping knew about the balloon. And that I don't believe that he personally signed off on it. So I think that there's a little bit of it shows some bureaucratic um, dysfunction in the system or, you know, that one part doesn't necessarily know what the other is doing. And there's a lack of coordination, which we which we know, generally speaking, China's system is incredibly stovepiped, especially when you talk about the military and the security services. Um, but I think that it's in my view, it's safe to say that Xi Jinping didn't personally sign off on this and say, this would be a great time to do this. And this is the manner we should do it. And we're going to send a message. So that's number one. Number two, though, it shows, you know, how susceptible this relationship is to crises um, that we can't necessarily predict or foresee. Nobody thought that there was going to be a spy balloon incident um, last year. But our ability to manage these crises is still very poor. Um, you know, we had hoped that we learned a lesson in 2001, again, with the EP3 incident, uh, that we need to learn how to manage these crises, how to handle them so they don't spiral out of control. And there's been a lot of ink spilled talking about US-China crisis uh, management mechanisms, um, crisis communications, hotlines, and everything like that. And the takeaway, I think, from the US side is that none of this would actually work during an act during a crisis that for all that we think we've discussed with the Chinese um, you know potential incidents such as this one when you actually when push comes to shove and you pick up the phone and you want to call uh, Beijing to basically say what's going on here what are your intentions this is what we're going to do uh, no one's going to pick up the phone until they've decided what their response is going to be. And that's still the uh, the way that they work and they operate. And I think you've seen, you know, now Deputy Secretary of State Kirk Campbell say exactly that, that we have no confidence that in a, in a crisis, the Chinese will actually pick up the phone uh, mm -hmm. and work to defuse it. It's going to be they're going to pick up the phone when they've decided this is what our response is going to be. It's funny, David, as you're talking and we're reflecting on the history of this, it, it seems like there's kind of two different pictures of China we get. Um, one is the increasingly aggressive, increasingly likely to do something counter to our interests, increasingly um, autocratic, sort of ambitious China. That, that's one picture. The other picture we get is the um, unfavorable demographics, has been passed by India as the world's largest country. Um, you know, some of this uh, autocracy is counterproductive to uh, their ambitions. It's stifling and sort of the, there's almost a slowing economic growth. There's this like China declining picture that is very different than the China 
more aggressive, more ambitious, more of a problem picture. Is it, is it one or the other? Is it the same? At, uh, is it both? Like how, how should we be thinking about China right now in terms of trying to, you know, kind of put it in a box, if you will? It's a really good question, and we've had a, a big debate on this topic in, in our magazine in Foreign Affairs, um, where some have argued that China is already a declining power, as you state, and others say that its best days are still ahead of it. Um, and what I would say, not to elude your, your, your question, but just to kind of maybe reposition it a little bit, is that China doesn't have to reach parity with the United States to cause enormous problems for us. And so the question of whether China will surpass the United States in terms of GDP, um, I think most believe that day will not come, or at least it won't come for a long, long time. Uh, whether the United, whether China catches up to the United States as a peer military, um, Xi Jinping has set very ambitious goals to become a world-class military, but will they catch up to the United States in aggregate terms? I don't think so. But again, they don't need to do any either of those two things to cause enormous problems for the United States. When we go back to potential Taiwan contingencies, well, Taiwan is only 100 miles off of China's coast, and it's, you know, I think 2,000 miles or so away from Guam. So China has certain built-in geographic and other advantages over us in potential um, you know conflicts in 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 Asia um, and and we our military has global responsibilities we're postured to do things in the Middle East in East Asia and and elsewhere and China's really focused on Taiwan contingencies South China Sea East China Sea and things in its in its backyard so um, I think that it's an important debate to have. I don't think that China is falling apart. Uh, I also don't think China is going to surpass the United States. And I would just say that on the trajectory that China is on right now, it's still going to be uh, a big challenge for us to manage and for us to protect our interests. I mentioned up front, you've been studying China, Taiwan, all these issues for, for a very long time. If you go back to, you don't have to go back very far, but let's say 2015 or so, you know, that was an era when, you know, China was at least economically very much part of the, of the, uh, you know, the, the economically advancing part of the world. Like it was an integral part of the machinery of the world. And it looked to be on a course uh, for great growth and great wealth and, now here we are nine years later, and we've just got a completely different picture. Was this inevitable? If I could have gotten you in 2015 and said, hey, David, 2024, uh, we're at odds with China. Uh, we're talking about these issues. Uh, China, we're at least debating its decline. Like, would you have been shocked? Or do you think a lot of this was... Uh, somehow inevitable, or at least you could see the beginnings of it way back when? I don't think that, um, that, you know, I don't think I was shocked or would be shocked. I mean, when you, when you look at this, you know, Xi Jinping has been in power for, you know, just over a decade now. And a lot of people kind of date this more assertive, emboldened China to Xi Jinping. But I actually think you could go back a little bit further to his predecessor, Hu Jintao. And I think that a pivotal point for the Chinese was the global financial crisis. And you can go back there. And that was when they thought, basically, why are we deferring to the Americans on all of this? Because they don't really know what they're doing. We can be just as good or better at, at all of this than the United States. And it was kind of the emperor has no clothes moment for the Chinese. And I think that's where they decided we can challenge them. Um, you know, I noticed, uh, you know, a more assertiveness from the Chinese starting then. If you think about South China Sea, a lot of that started around this time as well, the first steps to really take control of the South China mm -hmm. Sea. Um, and so, you know, I think that China was on that path and you, and you look at Xi Jinping, he has said in very explicit terms, you know, the East is rising, the West is falling. Um, you know, he has set forth these ambitious goals, uh, 
to achieve by 2049 the 100th anniversary of the People's Republic of China, by 2027 in terms of military objectives as well. I think that he's a fundamentally ambitious person who believes that um, you know China's time has has arrived and that the era of U.S. Um, predominance in the Indo-Pacific was essentially a historical aberration. And so we think of the last 75 years as kind of, you know, the way that the natural state of affairs. And I think the Chinese view that as a kind of gross historical injustice um, that they were too weak to oppose. And so you see this again with Xi Jinping talking about Asia for Asians, which in his conception excludes the United States. Um, they do not by the notion that the U.S. is a Pacific or an Asian power. And so, you know, they are kind of restoring the region to the way that they believe it should be and the, and the kind of natural or proper state of affairs. So, you know, I think nothing is inevitable. Um, of course, there are things that could have gone differently. But I think the broad contours of Chinese foreign policy um, and where Xi Jinping has taken taken his country, um, you know, would have gone in this direction regardless of what U.S. policy would have been. Um, I don't think if we had been more accommodating, Xi Jinping would have set his sights lower. Um, you know, and I don't think that the notion of a G2 that some people were talking about was ever, you know, in our interest or even possible or feasible. Um, and so, you know, I don't think it's like the debates we've had over Russia recently on whether there was a missed opportunity, um, you know, following the collapse of the Soviet Union. I don't really see it in, in those terms. Yeah, David, I got a lot of questions, but we'll probably keep it simple here. I mean, we had four years of Trump policy towards China. We've seen four years going on four years of Biden uh, policy towards China. And we might not, we might get another four years of Trump policy with China. Maybe you can compare and contrast the first four years of Trump's um, you know, presidency with Biden's and maybe what if, if Trump does get elected, what the, the policy might look in the next four years under a Trump uh, presidency? So I would say that the Trump administration and the Biden administration had a remarkably similar assessment of China. And if you look at both administrations, national security strategies or national defense strategies, they talk about China in strikingly similar terms as a um, as a challenger to the United States that seeks to you know overturn the U.S. led international order. The Biden administration talks about China as the only country with both the capability and the intent to challenge the U.S. led order. Um, you even look at statements on things like Xinjiang, where you have uh, you know individuals as different as Mike Pompeo and Tony Blinken, both terming it. Uh, genocide. Um, you know, support for Taiwan has been robust in both uh, administrations as well. The Biden administration, of course, has not removed the Trump era tariffs on China. So there is a lot of consistency. And I can just say that in all of my interactions with uh, Chinese interlocutors, you know, they, they saved that to me. They were expecting a difference. They were expecting kind of to go back to the Obama years, if you know, when Biden was elected, because he was surrounding himself with so many of the same people who were officials in the Obama administration. And in my view, they were surprised that there was so much continuity, and that really, you know, we there's a debate as well about to what extent is there a bipartisan consensus on China? How deep is that? But I think that the center of these debates has shifted. Um, from what we saw, you know, let's, let's say eight years ago or so. Um, so there's a lot of continuity there. The difference, I think, is in how you go about the China challenge. And for Trump, it was much more unilateral, focused narrowly on economics. You know, I think a lot of the bandwidth was taken up with the phase one deal, steps towards a phase two deal. Um, you know, I think that the U.S. Trade Representative's office really had a lot of the kind of power momentum in the relationship for the for the Biden administration it's been you know a lot more focused on US allies and partners as our asymmetric advantage vis-a-vis -vis China so a lot of investment in the quad in AUKUS in trilateral cooperation with South Korea and Japan you have things like the chips 4 alliance um, and things of that nature so i think that the way that they go 
that they address the China challenge is different, but I don't think you would have really anybody of prominence in either administration that says, well, China is not a big issue for us. And it doesn't threaten, um, you know, some core U.S. interests. Looking ahead to the a potential second Trump administration, of course, you know, he has put out there the 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 notion of sixty percent tariffs on Chinese goods, um, but you know I'm not going to be the first person to say that he's a mercurial individual. Um, you know he was for banning TikTok, and now he's saying publicly that the Biden administration shouldn't ban TikTok, and they should be blamed for banning TikTok. So in, in many senses, it's kind of the last person to speak to him. Um, you know prevails uh, on a on a certain issue. But, you know, I think that anybody who tells you exactly what his China playbook would be, um, you know, is kind of overstating his or her confidence in in what Trump is going to do. Because I could sit here today and I can make an argument that Trump is going to double down on tariffs and, uh, you know, Section 301 investigations and, you know, decoupling or whatever you want to call it. But I could also sit here and say that he's going to cut a deal with Xi Jinping that addresses his narrow, you know, economic and trade interests and leaves other things, um, you know, out there. So I think it could cut either way under a second Trump administration. David, I might build upon some of that train of thought, which is the continuity between Biden and Trump on a lot of these issues. And I think when I look at past examples where there's sort of been bipartisan hostility towards a country or a region, former Soviet Union, now Russia, over most of the time, Iran. These are all countries that, while important for energy or oil markets, are not integrated into the global economy, uh, either with us or the world, as is China. And we are highly dependent on them for low-cost manufactured goods, for keeping inflation low. I think this iPad that I am recording on comes from China. That says my iPhone. Um, but vice versa, they're dependent on us for grains. They need us as much as we need them. In the tail risk scenario, maybe it's not tail risk, but the risk scenario of China and Taiwan and something more dramatic happening there, could we cut them off? Could they be cut off from us? Or is this just really tough talk that on the margin, we might have higher tariffs, we have rhetoric, but unlike these other examples, you, you can't really excise China from the world economy or, or vice versa from their perspective. It seems very different, their degree of integration to the global economy. And I'm curious as a foreign policy expert, how you think through that. I think that's I think that's totally right. I mean, um, you know, the Biden administration has said publicly, I think, mostly to reassure the Chinese that we don't seek decoupling. They've adopted the European Commission's terminology of de-risking, um, which seems to have a, a narrower writ um, and to be focused on really those national security applications. But the Chinese complain that, you know, we keep talking about a small yard high fence, but, you know, the yard keeps getting bigger and bigger. And so, in my view, you know, decoupling is not feasible, and it would have a lot of the effects that you're talking about. It would be inflationary, and it would hurt, you know, middle class Americans and and people who are buying, you know, any any kind of uh, household products. But I also think that the realization, given the you know supply chain issues during the pandemic, and given these kind of looming issues with China geopolitically is that we can't be completely dependent on China for, you know, active pharmaceutical ingredients or for, you know, semiconductors or rare earth minerals. And so when you're thinking about how you would uh, potentially fight uh, a conflict against China, you know, we have to be... Um, we have to be self-sufficient in those, or we have to have good supply chains with allies and partners that exclude China. And I think that's where the conversation is right now. And so we see that, you know, most starkly in semiconductors with the Chips and Science Act, um, but we also see it, um, you know, in other industries as well. So, and then of course you have the new issue of overcapacity, which is a totally kind of different but related set of issues on EVs, batteries, um, you know, solar panels and things of that nature. So I don't think that there's anybody who is seriously making the argument for decoupling and saying that we can just sever the economic ties that we have between us. But I also don't think that there's anybody who says that the status quo or what 
relationship we had five years ago is sustainable and smart. And so it's about identifying those industries where we're far too reliant on China and figuring out where else we can source you know these uh, raw materials or or products from and I think that you see that you know I, again I study Taiwan a lot you can see that Taiwan is pulling up a lot of the roots from China and it's investing in Southeast Asia the FDI flows are way down uh, trade flows are also down I mean countries uh, can see the writing on the wall a lot of it, frankly, is wasn't geopolitically driven, but it was because of the lockdowns in China and the loss of confidence because of that. But nonetheless, um, you know, a lot of countries are investing in India and Southeast Asia, and they are diversifying uh, out of the China market. So one thing, David, I was thinking back on your, your comment about how the financial crisis, many elements of the, of the Chinese uh, current foreign policy and ambitions, you, you could see the, the beginnings of them then. Um, it does seem like, though, that one of, the, one of the things, if we were talking to 2015 David Sachs, uh, that is different now, is the, the way in which the sort of the, the political control has been hardened around Xi Jinping and a country that was, we might have debated its ambitions or its trajectory, but it seemed like the country was on a path of more liberalization or more openness, or at least it wasn't going backwards. And now it seems like it's going backwards. Does that surprise you? Is that trend going to continue? Is that a fair characterization? Like in China, what is the feeling about all these decisions that seem to be kind of locking down the country more uh, less openness, et cetera. So I think it's a pretty fair characterization. And so what I would say is that, you know, the paradigm that most um, China analysts used for, for literally decades was that, um, you know, the, the implicit bargain that the Chinese Communist Party had with the Chinese people was, you know, don't ask for political rights um, or freedoms, but, you know, your lives materially will be better than your parents, which were better than your grandparents, and your kids' lives will be better yeah. than yours. Yeah. And so as a result of that bargain, you would say that their priority was above all else economic growth. And how you achieve economic growth is through, you know, openness and liberalization and, you know, wooing foreign companies and investors and things of that nature. And so uh, people expected that all of that would would continue. Um, but what we've seen instead under Xi Jinping is really the securitization of everything. Everything is viewed primarily through the lens of security. Um, and that's a big that's a big change. And so when you, you know you pick up the paper in the morning, it's about data security, uh, it's about raids on foreign consulting firms, it's about data localization. Um, you know, read the national security law for Hong Kong and the extremely broad definitions um, of what's considered espionage or anything like that. I mean, it's just it's security first. Um, and, you know, the question is kind of whether <laughs> you, you imagine that they have to see that this isn't good for the economy and the FDI numbers reveal that, right? Um, but they continue to pledge. We're opening up, you know, with, you had all these U.S. business leaders in Beijing a few weeks ago and the message was we're open from business, for business, come invest. At the same time, though, you have the raids on consulting firms and you have the you know unpredictable business environment and we could see all of that reflected in testimonials from, from U.S. companies. So something just doesn't really add up there. Um, you know, and there are no concrete pledges coming out of the, the leadership in terms of economic policies that are going to change to be more inviting to, to foreign competition. So I think that the, the fundamental framework or paradigm that we look at Xi's China has to be different, which is that we can no longer assume that they're going to take the path that's most economically um, kind of efficient or, or the best one. And it's going to be about security and the party security above all else. So I was, I was thinking of a handful of questions as you were going through all that. Um, maybe I'll just throw them at you in a, in a triple. 
Uh, one is, you know, could we get a, a Gorbachev kind of thing where the next leader, you know, turns back towards openness? So keep that one in mind. Uh, but the other one is um, sometimes this seems like a U.S. China competition where then, and meanwhile, China and the Europeans and China and other countries are, are kind of a little more business as usual. And this is just a U.S. China problem. And then other times it feels like, no, this is a the West versus China type problem. Talk to us about that. And, and, and also, is there someone waiting in the wings who might reverse course on this from a China perspective? The interesting thing is that uh Nobody really knows who is waiting in the wings. I mean, Xi Jinping is a very, very good tactician politically. Um, and I, you know, he knows that if he anoints his successor or seems to tap on the shoulder somebody who could succeed him, then his power is diminished and everybody's going to start, um, mm. you know, playing up to the new guy and trying to curry favor with the new guy. So he has broken all of the informal rules that we thought. You know, existed in terms of who gets to sit on the Politburo and the Politburo Standing Committee. He obviously broke the term limits when it was limited to two five-year terms for for General Secretary of the CCP. Um, and I think that Xi Jinping intends to rule China. Um, you know, his his next his third term would end in 2027. His fourth term would end in 2032. Uh, I think he intends to rule at least until then. Um, you know, his, his mother is in her late nineties and, and she's still alive. Um, I, I don't, uh, you know, I think that he has that potentially on his side. And, um, I think he's in the same or a similar position as somebody like Putin, where it's very difficult to figure out how to get off this horse and to, uh, <laughs> and to keep your head. Um, and so he's made a lot of enemies on his way up the anti-corruption drive, um, made a lot of enemies, um, you know, within the party. And so I think that Xi Jinping intends to hold on to power as long as he can. So to this other question, if we were having a, um, the German equivalent of the Council on Foreign Relations or France or the UK or some other countries, are, are they having a parallel kind of mindset shift around China or is it more pronounced in the U.S.? that this is uh, somehow our problem more than anyone else's? I think that if you look at the, I would start with the region, because the countries that have already borne the brunt of Chinese aggression are primarily in the Indo-Pacific. But you talk about you know the coercive measures that China took against Australia, Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, the trade measures. I mean, these countries have all concluded essentially that they don't want to live in a region of Chinese hegemony. They want the United States to be there. And you, you look at Japan, they're almost doubling their defense budget, acquiring counter-strike capabilities, things that people thought they would never see out of post-war Japan. Australia signing on to, to AUKUS, getting a nuclear-powered submarine capability, increasing their defense budget, the Philippines as well. Um, so the countries that have the power to, um, to balance against China are going to do so. Um, the the weaker countries in the region that don't really have an option, they don't have a treaty alliance with the United States, and they don't have enough power on their own to balance against China. They're doing you know more bandwagoning and trying to accommodate Chinese interests. But I think that you have seen a big turn away from China in the Indo Pacific. Uh, India as well, right? Was is one that we should mention in Europe. Um, you know, I think that the war in Ukraine has severely damaged China's interests there. I mean, they were courting the European Union, but now China's on the opposite side of a of a fight that is really existential for the wet for Western Europe for NATO, um, and they see that you know China is aligning heavily with Russia and now. You know, according to reports and intelligence and things like that, you know really helping bail out Russia's defense industrial base so that it can continue to prosecute this war. So we have seen a shift um, from from the Europeans. 
there seems to be a little daylight as there usually is between Germany and the rest of the of the bloc. And we saw that with uh, the chancellor's visit to Beijing last week and signing, you know, cooperative agreements on connected vehicles and things like that, just as the EU is investigating Chinese EVs. Um, but I think that you know, again, to kind of get back to where the conversation started, which is how much this has shifted over the last maybe five to seven or eight years, I think that the Europeans have shifted more towards our um, kind of analysis of where China is rather than away from it. Um, you know, no one in the United Kingdom is talking about a golden era for UK-China relations anymore, um, like they were at that time. I think that the kind of you know the fantasies that some had are are gone um i think that europe is much more realistic as it pertains to to china yeah david i you know kind of look at china and you know try to wonder whether they're getting stronger or weaker what's perception and what's reality and you know you turn around and like you said a couple of weeks ago you had a bunch of uh, businessmen over in china but what you're seeing is capital flows into china are down rather significantly uh, you're looking at basically, it seems like every six months, there's a real estate crisis going on in China. You know, you, they look, you look at their population growth is hitting a wall. It's going to decline quite significantly. You look at their pension system. and I thought this was crazy. It makes U.S. Social Security look like it's gold plated, <laughs> to be honest with you. And so it seems to me like all these issues are probably, they scare me more than they basically, you know, make me you know, feel good about the company because, it feels like in the next 10, 15, 20 years that they're going to be a weaker country, not a stronger country. And what does that mean, uh, especially for someone who does get weaker? Does that make them more likely to strike out and do something? So I could say that, um, you know, I don't know if they're just putting on a brave face, but, but the, the leadership there still thinks like they have all of this under control. And some of it could be, of course, you know, just putting on a brave face, but they believe that they've identified the problems in the system, that they know exactly how to uh, address them, and they don't need other people telling them what they need to do. And um, I'm I'm a bit surprised at the confidence that I hear there in terms of, you know, we got this, uh, don't worry about it, especially given all the indicators that you mentioned that we, um, that we see. But of course, there are huge... Um, huge structural issues in china demographically environmentally the real estate the uh the you know the fact that they still have not made progress towards really incentivizing or boosting domestic demand and consumption and even xi jinping is is now publicly railing against welfareism as he terms it um coming out against you know um stimulus that would that would um, boost domestic demand. So, you know, to me and you, the problems are clear, um, but they believe they have a way of solving it. I don't know what they are, um, but, you know, that's that's what their uh, attitude is. But I, I do tend to believe that if China does have a, a profound kind of crisis that rather than turning inward, they might be more prone to 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 lash out because again what is the basis for the ccp's continued uh monopoly on political power if not providing sustained economic growth and bettering the lives of of china's citizens um and so you're going to have to create a new basis for regime legitimacy and i think that the easiest thing for the ccp to do is to base it in nationalism um and and that's that is i think a, a well-founded fear you know david at veriden we are sort of focused on energy markets and, and and these kind of things i want to ask you about electric vehicles um it's obviously a subject of a lot of debate as it relates to oil demand and these kind of things and one of the big questions now is the affordability of evs um and a big question will be will chinese china is the one country which has uh, produce some very low cost EVs for their citizens, and will they get exported? So there's, a, of course, a long history in the auto markets of cheap Japanese imports in the 80s, and then Korean imports, and China would seem to be the next thing, but it's coming at this time of hostility, and in the US, perhaps currently bipartisan support, but you do have a split where Democrats will talk more openly about climate concerns and electric vehicles, and President Trump specifically will say, no, we, you know, it, it's a hoax, and we don't want, I'm wondering if this could be an area for split, 
whether you think Chinese EVs will start penetrating U.S. markets. There's, of course, security concerns related to the chips that go into these cars. How do you see that playing out, I guess, for the U.S., but perhaps is Europe as well, where clearly the German manufacturers are very important to especially those economies and will also face perhaps these threats from low-cost Chinese. They're the one country that seems to so far crack the code on producing much lower-cost electric vehicles in contrast to other producers. Yeah, so I'm not uh, an electric vehicle expert, so you you all probably know more than me, but my gut is that I think that it's going to be very difficult to see the day where you have BYD cars on the streets of American cities that are as ubiquitous as Teslas or Hyundais or anything like that. Um, you know, I think that the United States is going to do what it needs to do, frankly, to protect its domestic auto industry. I mean, we saw that, of course, in the financial crisis that we weren't going to let that go under. I think that it's a obviously it generates a lot of of pretty good jobs and um, you know is a source of of strength and pride. And so I think that there's going to be barriers erected to these Chinese um, EVs. Uh, what form they take, whether it's tariffs or non-tariff barriers, you know, who knows? But um, I don't believe that, you know, listen, China built this EV industry under enormous protection. Um, and now it's unleashing it on the world. And I don't think that the United States or uh, or Japan or South Korea or you know many countries in the in the EU are going to let this let this happen. I think China will probably make inroads in Eastern Europe and in and in Southern Europe. Um, I think that they'll make inroads, and they've already made inroads in Southeast Asia, of course. But I think that where you have countries that have real uh, auto uh, industries, they're going to protect those. Um, that's that's what I think. I, you know, I think Germany's Germany's position is interesting, uh, and I'm not really sure if I understand why they're taking the position that they do. Um, because to me, I think the end game for China is that you know Chinese companies are going to be the only ones that are active in the China market. Uh, maybe German auto brands think that their cachet and their brands are so valuable that it doesn't matter how much an Audi or a Mercedes is, Chinese consumers are going to want to have that logo and they're going to want to show off to their friends that they have it. I just don't think that that's necessarily a winning strategy. I think the end game for China is pretty clear here. Um, you know, they're not going to want you know, Toyota and GM and uh, and Ford to be competing within the China market. So, do you sense India will also resist BYD? It's a good question. I mean, I think that you know the extent to which China India ties have frayed is not really something that people saw happening. Um, you know, that border clash, the deadly border clash from a few years ago, really did lead to a rethinking in India uh, about China India ties, and then you know I. Think we even had India banning Huawei five G things like that that we didn't think would happen, and so I think that it could go down that road as well. Um, you know, I think that there's deep suspicion within India. Um, I don't know if they'll make the security argument about connected vehicles and data and things of that nature, but um, I think I would. I think it would be hard for me to see. You know, again, Chinese EVs becoming really ubiquitous in India, given the geopolitical environment that exists now. David, I'm curious. I was thinking about some of your lead in comments and you didn't say it this way, but I, in a way, almost heard it this way, which is the Chinese can't be trusted. So does that I don't want to be unfair to you, but does that sort of lock us into a certain there can be no, I'm back to my salt, uh, uh, cold war analogies. There can be no salt to treaty. Like there can be no, like somehow, uh, we're just going to stay on some kind of path of low level competition and quasi hostility because there's really not a choice. Is that, is that unfair? Well, I guess, you know, the, um, you know, I think it's, 
if, if you're thinking about something like an arms control agreement, and we're going to have these conversations with the Chinese over things like AI, where there's already a dialogue that was set up after President Biden saw Xi Jinping in San Francisco, we're going to have to talk to them at some point about nuclear uh, arms control, given China's rapid build up there. We're going to have to talk about the use of space and warfare and things like that. We have to have these conversations. Um, you know, but I guess it was Reagan, trust but verify. I mean, there's going to need to be stringent verification mechanisms in any of this. I don't think that it would be smart to just take anybody's word on on things like this. Um, so I guess what my focus would be on, though, rather than the question of trust in U.S.-China relations, would be about just to kind of underscore or highlight the seriously conflicting nature of our interests here. Um, and if you just look at core U.S. interests in the region and globally and China's interests, it's very hard to find overlapping areas there. Um, you know, and it extends to our alliance system in Asia, which is a core interest of ours, but is something that China believes is an anachronism and a legacy of the Cold War that fuels insecurity in the region. Um, you know, whether it's Taiwan, where we have obviously a very uh, different view than China on that, whether it's now, you know, European security and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, you look at literally any issue around the world. And we're on opposite sides of that. And, uh, and some of it's structural. Some of it is also choices that we've made and China have made. But it's very difficult for me to find most of those being, uh, being resolved. So, you know, I personally don't focus that much on, on trust. I focus more on kind of our core interests and what China defines as, as, as its interests and looking at the extent to which those are compatible or incompatible. And I think that, you know, they're mostly incompatible, to be honest. And that's the, that's the issue and that's the challenge for diplomats and, um, and for our leadership. I, I feel like, David, as we get to the end, uh, we have more questions in reserve for you than any other guest. Like we're probably st <laughs> sitting on another 25 questions, uh, but we'll have to let you go because you've been so generous with your time. It does seem a shame though. We haven't talked about one thing, which is what is the, what is if you're in Taiwan right now, if you're, if you're the Taiwanese government or this, the Taiwanese population, what is your perspective? There's been all this talk and speculation about China, you know, doing something. The U.S. has been more assertive around Taiwan. The U.S. has the CHIP Act, which is sort of aimed at reducing reliance on Taiwan. Like, what is the feeling if you're in Taiwan? They just had an election. Just give us a little dose of Taiwan before we have to let you go. Yeah. So, you know, I think that in Taiwan, there is also the, the war in Ukraine was really a dose of reality there. I think that to be honest, prior to the war in Ukraine mo and prior to Hong Kong as well, many Taiwanese thought that basically, well, China just talks about using military force and unification because that's um, an easy way to score points domestically, tap into nationalism and, and things like that, but they don't really mean it. And they would never actually do something that stupid um, as trying <clears throat> a blockade or an invasion of Taiwan with potential US intervention. But again, Hong Kong and then Russia's invasion of Ukraine, I think really was kind of uh, the wake-up moment um, for Taiwanese people. This could happen to us, regardless of whether we think it's irrational. And so, you know, under President Tsai's leadership, the current president of Taiwan for the past eight years, military spending has almost doubled. Um, conscription has been extended from four months to one year. You have a lot of kind of tycoons, businessmen, and NGOs funding um, civil society organizations to teach emergency response. Um, things as simple as, you know, tying a tourniquet and doing, um, you know, kind of how to deal with mass casualty events. So they're taking it much more seriously. They're focusing now also on societal resilience, things 
you know, you you guys focus on energy. Well, Taiwan uh, imports almost all of its energy, and it's taking offline its two remaining nuclear reactors. And so, how do you deal with a potential blockade of the island when you don't have fuel to last you much more than a few weeks, right? Um, and how do you also you know, deal with things like your water supply, your medical um, needs and, and things of that nature. So Taiwan is grappling with all of this. I would just say, though, there's no really uh, silver bullets or easy fixes. This is going to take a long, long time for them to, to work out. Um, but I think that they're moving moving in the right direction. I think that the, the takeaway for the Taiwanese is not that we basically just need to place our faith in the in Xi Jinping and China that they're not going to do anything. It's that we have to make this so difficult and so unappealing for China that they literally cannot, you know, crack this nut. And so um that's the focus of the military now. That's the focus of the society as well. Um but again, it's it's going to be a long process for Taiwan to get there. Could you imagine a scenario in the in the pre uh, in the Ukraine pre invasion? There was this debate about well, if you put U.S. Uh, or Western military weaponry, etc., there, you're going to provoke him. And the counter argument was, if you put it there, he won't come. As you think about Taiwan, if we woke up tomorrow and there was a an American base had been announced and we just said, okay, we're there now. And if you come, it's war. Is that a, is that a rational foreign policy choice for the U S is something like that on the table or is that just kind of too out there to even talk about? Well, I think that there's some people who are talking about things like that, but I don't think that it's necessarily in the um, in the mainstream to put a kind of tripwire force on Taiwan. I mean, the assumption in these types of circles has always been that China assumes the United States will come to Taiwan's defense. And so you don't necessarily have to explicitly tell the Chinese that because they already assume that. I question that a little bit I th because I think that the Chinese assumed that when we could come to Taiwan's defense at a relatively low cost. Um, but of course, given the PLA's rapid modernization and new Chinese capabilities, I I wonder to what extent China still says, well, the United States will come even if it means, you know, big losses and, uh, you know, unsure of of victory. And so um I I personally am on the side of being more explicit that we would defend Taiwan and I've written about that. I don't mm. think that you necessarily need a tripwire force. We could defend Taiwan with the assets that we have in Japan and elsewhere in the region. Um mm. and of course we don't want to provoke the war that we're trying to to prevent. Um but I do think that deterrence right now in the Taiwan Strait is not going in the right direction or the direction we want it to go to, go go in. And so we do need to do more to reinforce deterrence uh, as it relates to Taiwan. And I think there's a number of things that we can do. You know, it was good that with the aid bill to Ukraine that was passed over the weekend, there was money and funding for Taiwan there. Um, you know, we talk about how much this whole conversation has changed in the last couple of years. It would have been unthinkable to have Taiwan, you know, uh, to have money appropriated for Taiwan in a in a supplemental like that. And that's how much I think the kind of stakes have sharpened, as well as the fear that China and Xi Jinping might actually do something, and the fact that we need to do more to to deter a conflict. Well, as I say, um, th this is really hard to let you go because it's been so fascinating. Uh, David, we really appreciate it. I really wanted to dig in on Hans Morgenthau and the you, there you are in the capital of international diplomacy, the Council on Foreign Relations, and we just might have to uh, beg beg you to come back for another show sometime. <laughs> sure. Happy to. Thanks for having me, guys. David Sachs, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>